Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And I'll speak on the topic of tap your inner power. We all seek power. Even if we are just living in our own homes. Even if the small baby just knew on. The baby seeks power by crying as loudly as possible. What is that power? The baby cries loudly. So everybody else drops what they are doing. Sarva Dharma and Parintech. just give up everything and run to pay attend to the baby. Now of course sometimes the babies may be in great pain and they need a help, need attention. Sometimes they may just be crying because they want attention. They don't have any other need. But whatever it is, uh, for a baby who is just born and is hopeless, the, the realization that by crying, I have some power. I can attract others to come and attend to me. Similarly, when we grow and learn language, that gives another level of sophistication to our ability to change things in the outer world. When we want education, what the purpose is, Francis Bacon said that education, knowledge is power. The idea is, we pursue knowledge so that we can have greater power. Power to earn money, power to have a position, power to have respect. Practically everything that we do, at one level, we are looking for power. Even you could say at one level, even relationships, we are looking for power. Now, every relationship begins with the hope that we will be able to change the other person according to our will. So, once a marriage counsellor was counselling the couples, so he asked all the men to separate in two groups. All the men who can control your wives, move on this side. And all the women, men who are controlled by their wives, move on this side. So all the men moved on the left side. Mm. But except only one man moved on the other side. He asked him, do you really control your wife? No, actually my wife told me to come here. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, <laughs> every relationship at one level is an attempt to control. Now. Of course, control or power itself is not bad. It is the intent, the motive for what are we seeking power. Now, parents want some power over their children so that they can discipline and guide them so that they can become responsible citizens. Now, we may want some control in the relationship so that the other person can do what responsibly they want to do. But basically, the point is we are all looking for power. At a broader level, scientific research is all motivated by the search for power. We now have nuclear weapons which have the power to destroy the whole world many times over. So all a, at one level a search for power. However, there is one power which very few of us even seek to discover. What to speak of actually discover. And that is our inner power. We can have outer power to varying degrees. But that power can slip away from us at any moment. I just a few a month or so ago I met a person who had been very wealthy, very popular, very influential, and somehow a series of things went wrong in his life, and now he was on a bed in an accident, immobilized, he had lost his position, he had lost his fame. Many of his admirers had turned against him. And he was broken. Now, when I thought about, and I talk, was talking with him, it struck me that he still had reasonable amount of wealth. He still had a reasonable amount of resources to live on. He would recover from whatever disease he had. But I noticed that what hurt him most was the sense of powerlessness. 
So, so life can sometimes put us in situations where we have no external power at all. And those situations can become opportunities for us to discover our inner power. What is outer power and what is inner power? Outer power is the power over the things in the outer world. It can be people, objects, processes, situations. Inner power is the power over our inner world. The power over our thoughts, emotions, desires, intentions, ultimately actions. And sometimes as we are moving forward in the world today, actually many of us by technology have got a lot of outer power. But we have lost inner power. And that's why our minds are troubling us so much. And for many people, many mental health problems, some of them may require clinical attention, but many of them are just the mind hurting and tormenting us. And suicide is the ultimate expression of the total loss of inner power. Where the person has no power over their mind and their mind turns against them and kills them. So we all need inner power and what do we, how can we develop that inner power? So I'll talk about this using an acronym TAB and I'll illustrate this principle of inner power through the life of Srila Prabhupada. How he had was put in a situation of utter powerlessness. But there he exhibited inner power. So suppose we are working on a computer. Now, some people when they work on their computers, it's like they have 25 tabs open. And the 25 tabs open and they have some loud blaring music coming from somewhere. The 25 tabs open, three of them are frozen and they don't know from where that noise is coming. So what to do is stuck over there. So uh, we, we become stuck like that mentally sometimes. We don't even know where we are stuck or how we are stuck. Just, I'm stuck. So if there is some unwanted image that is opened up, sometimes some pop-ups come up on a computer or device, and then you look around, where do you minimize it? You can't see it all. <laughs> some deceptive pop-ups, they are such that the cross is merged with the background color. You can't find it only. So if you can't, even if you can't minimize something, you can just shift your screen to somewhere else. Even if we can't close a tab, we can still open a new tab. So tab refers to three things. Thoughts, attitudes and behavior. So oh, when we are in an external disempowered situation, when nobody is listening to us, we don't have good health, we don't have money, we don't have any of the external sources of power. At that time, still we can have inner power. Inner power means we can still have power over what we think about, how we look at the outer situation, and what we do in that outer situation. So let's see how this power can be exhibited. Nishila Prabhupada, at the age of 69, went from India or came from India to America all alone without any money, without any contacts, without any institutional support. He, when he stepped onto that ship, Jaladuta, all alone, it was one of the greatest acts of courage in human history. The old people, for them to go alone on such a journey, it's, it was, at least in India, he was respected as a sadhu. Any respect of any religious person's house he would go, he would at least get some food get some Dakshina, could live, but in the West, he didn't know anything. He didn't even know at that time whether he would get vegetarian food, he was a strict vegetarian. He carried some vegetables with him, so that's all. So when he started coming there, as he came to America, the only resource he had was his body. Although his body was old, still his body was functioning well. But that resource also collapsed. 
first he got severe seasickness and after that he got two devastating heart attacks i have met people who have got heart attacks and yeah, nowadays if somebody gets a heart attack immediately you know there is emergency resuscitation you rush call the call one i uh, call the emergency and take them to the hospital and get help them survive but what to speak of calling emergency there was no medical support on the on that uh, ship itself so he had to bear it all alone and he somehow survived it so you could say that he had become from the external perspective completely disempowered now prabhupada wrote a diary at that time in which he reported his thoughts his experiences whatever were there so in one of the diary entries he writes that i am reading about the lord i am reading the chaitanya charitamrit and thinking about the lord is the nectar that is sustaining my life our thoughts can literally energize us or de-energize us you can see sometimes some people if they have, have many many problems in their lives when they walk they are like drooping they feel as if the whole burden of the world is on them and then they hear one more bad news one bad thought comes in they just collapse completely so sometimes a thought pops up within us and we just get completely energized see suppose we have a phone and then we charge the phone but as we are doing our work and two uh, we are just going about our work and three hours we find the phone has only 10% battery remaining hey what happened i didn't talk much so what had happened is maybe in that phone there are energy sucking apps which are functioning in the background and although we are doing nothing they are sucking the energy so for us our thoughts can become like those energy sucking apps in the phone sometimes we wake up and even without doing anything in a few hours we feel so tired <laughs> some people they wake up the only thing they wake, they look forward to after waking up is the next nap <laughs> when the thoughts the, the thoughts can completely de-energize us on the other hand say uh, if we are having very if we are very burdened by things but if one positive thought one sweet memory one one and one good thought comes within us that thought can energize us so our thoughts can have tangible effects on us and in that sense what we think about is important so as said, when we have lost when we are in a situation where we have little or no outer power oh, i have this problem i have this problem this problem this problem we can feel totally burdened by that and we may feel oh, what can i do i have to think about this problem otherwise how will i solve it yes we have problems and we need to think about them to solve them but it's not that simple because you know it's not that if we consider the problem a graph of problem solving capacity versus time so if we think about the problem we get some clarity about it if i don't think about a problem only then that's a problem also if i have a problem i have to think about it so the more we think about it our clarity increases but this line does not go onward infinitely when we think about it we get some clarity okay this happens i do this if this happens i do this if i do that i do that but if we keep thinking about the problem then that graph becomes flat after that we think 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 but don't get any clarity any further clarity and if we still keep thinking about it then that graph starts going down we get more confused as i say paralysis by analysis Paralysis. Yes, we keep thinking, thinking, overthinking, and we just make a mess. You know, we have fan over here. Now, normally, when the fan goes round and round, it cools us down. But when our thoughts go round and round, they heat us up. <laughs> we just get completely exhausted. So, 
we do need to think about problems, but only to the extent that thinking is constructive. Overthinking about a problem can also become a problem. And that's why what we think about will determine that that is in our control. We have an outer problem and what we think about is still in our power. So when we practice when we, pra when we practice Bhakti Yoga, Bhakti Yoga is not just about coming to a temple and attending some Katha. It's about training our mind. What is training our mind to think about Krishna? Bhakti is not about doing some ritual. Bhakti is about making our mind spiritual. Making our mind spiritual means that we learn to make our mind attached to Krishna, attracted to Krishna. And just thinking about Krishna because he's all attractive, because he's all powerful, because he's all loving, even if we don't understand all this consciously, just thinking about him can make us peaceful, can give us a sense of peace, can give us a sense of clarity, can give us a sense of confidence. And you can practically experience this. Maybe very agitated, come to a temple, behold the Lord, maybe hear his kirtan, and you will start feeling calm. We don't even understand from where that calmness is coming. But you start feeling some amount of calmness. So uh, even uh, there's been surveys done that even atheists, when they come to some holy place like a temple or uh, some place like that, they also hold that there's something about this place. We feel calmer here. But they don't necessarily say it's a divine presence. This is just some vibes are there over here. But the point is, when we direct our thoughts towards God, that gives us strength. It's like say, outside, it's very hot and then we come into an air-conditioned room. Then, the outside temperature has not yet changed. But we can get relief from that outside temperature. So similarly, when we have a lot of problems, that's like outside, it's very hot. When we start thinking about Krishna, what happens is at least we get relief. So, no matter how bad things are in our life, no matter how powerless we are, what we think about is in our control. And by practicing bhakti, what happens is we gain more power to direct our thoughts constructively. We first direct our thoughts toward Krishna, get calmness, and then we redirect, our, then we return rejuvenated to deal with the problem more fresh, with greater freshness, with greater vigor. So this power is something which if we develop, that even amidst difficult situations, we can have resilience. We can have the strength to bounce back. So uh, what is the acronym we are discussing? TAB. Tab. And T was? Thoughts. Thoughts. So by practicing bhakti, we can learn to think about Krishna and make our thoughts our friends instead of our enemies. Just as friends encourage us, thoughts about Krishna will energize us, encourage us. Thoughts about the problems will keep this de-energizing and discouraging us. So this power is something we all can develop. So when we are chanting the holy names, when we are doing our puja, when we are doing our sadhana, when we are studying scripture, it's not just a ritual to be done. The purpose is to think about Krishna. And the more we think about Krishna, the more our mind will become attached to him. And then thinking about him will become easier. So even when problems are there, we'll be able to think about him at that time. But if we are not habituated ourselves to think of Krishna through regular bhakti practice, then it will be much more difficult to think about him at that time. So oh, that is T. What is A, I said? Attitude. Now, attitude means how do we look at the problem? The problem is there, but how do I look at the problem? We may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. I repeat, we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. So, attitude means 
I can think, oh, this problem is so big, it is so unmanageable, my life is, I'm so powerless, I'm such a, my destiny is rotten. And we can make that, we can see that problem as big and unmanageable and start feeling sorry for ourselves. Or we can say, yes, this problem is there, but problems have some purpose. So let me try to face this problem as well as I can. The problems, if we see that the problem is meant for some purpose, it's meant to help us teach something, help us learn something, help us grow. That's what the Bhagavad Gita tells us, that the universe is a university. That whatever happens in the world, it's not just by random chance. His things happen and bad things also happen. And it's not that the Bhagavad Gita is saying that when we say attitude, it's not a naive, Pollyannish optimism. That means now some people say everything happens is good. There are some people who put a Gita Sar in their uh, homes, essence of Gita. And then Gita Sar, they say that, Jo hua wo achha hua. Jo ho raha hai wo achha ho raha hai. Jo hone wala hai wo bhi achha hi hoga. What happened was good, what is happening is good, what will happen will also be good. Now, I have read the Gita over a hundred, several hundred times actually. But I have never found any words which says anything like this. <laughs> The Gita now, uh, is not say, so much talking about what happens to us as it focuses on how we respond to it. That is the thrust of the Gita. So, it's not that everything that happens is good. Bad things do happen in life. But, everything that happens can be for good. Everything that happens is not good. But everything that happens can be for good. That means, some good can emerge from the bad. What has happened right now, it's bad. And I can't imagine that it is good. It's terrible. Sometimes we might get a horrible disease. Sometimes the relationship might break down. Sometimes we might lose our job. Some, so many things can happen. Bad things do happen in life. But if you understand that there is some overarching plan for the world. And whatever bad is happening, something good will emerge out of it then that attitude, the attitude that everything that happens is a part of a bigger plan. That can help us to look at things with greater positivity. Now, is this just some sentimental imagination or that everything happens for good? Not exactly. Because if we see our own lives, even for our own existence, we are dependent on so many factors beyond our existence. That means, say, we all eat food every day. Suppose after this program there is Prasad. Not suppose, I think Prasad is there. <laughs> but, but, say now, when you are going to have Prasad, we often worry about cooking the food and earning the money so that we can get the food. But how often, do we think about digesting the food? Isn't it? Usually the only time we think about our digestion is when it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so now, the food that we eat, if it were not digested, we would not get energy. And we don't digest it ourselves in the sense that we have not created the mechanisms by which it is digested. So for our very existence, we are dependent on things which are beyond our power to control. Certainly, we have to put in some effort. So, we also have a part in the plan. But we are not doing everything. When a baby is born into the world, at that time, uh, the most intimate acts of affection is when the mother breastfeeds the baby. If the mother doesn't do that, it will be very difficult for the baby to survive. So certainly it's the mother's love that she offers her own milk to the baby. At the same time, it's not that the mother does something special to produce the milk at that time. The same God who sent the baby into the world through the mother's womb also sends milk in her breasts 
so that she can feed the baby. So there is our there is the mother's part in taking care of the baby, but the mother's part is not the entire thing. And that same principle applies to every aspect of our life. That our existence doesn't depend only on our efforts. There is much more beyond our efforts which also plays a role in our existence and uh, whatever achievements we make in our life, whatever things happen in our life, so there is a higher plan. So the understanding that, okay, whatever is happening, it may be for bad, it may be bad right now, but it is for good. This attitude is not just sentimentality, it is based on reality. Now when, uh, a bird, a baby bird is inside a nest. The same nest, sorry, not the nest, it, when the baby bird is inside a shell. Now initially, if there were no, if there were no shell, the baby bird would not survive. But then that shell has to break. And breaking that shell is painful. But to the extent that shell is broken, then the baby bird comes out. And if somebody just comes along and breaks the shell first, what happens? The baby bird comes out easily, but the baby bird's wings are not developed enough. And it, ca it can't carry its own weight, and it can't fly. Any predator can come and pounce on it and eat it. When the baby bird is trying to break the shell, it requires a lot of energy, a lot of energy. Sometimes it just pushes and breaks the shell. And then part of its wing comes out and then the shells are just again fall in place. And then the baby bird is squeezed by that. But again it pushes. Through all that effort, what is happening? The baby bird is developing the strength of its body, its wings. So prob problems are like that. We are living in some shell and we need to break that shell to come out. We need to go. So bad things happen in life. but Everything that happens can be for good. So if you have the attitude, okay, this problem is there, it is terrible, but something good will emerge from it. Then we will not beat ourselves up with our own negativity. Now, some people can find solutions to all problems. And some people can find problems with all solutions. <laughs> Whatever you tell them, no, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. This is not going to work. Some people are skeptical. Skeptical means that they can tell in every plan what is wrong. Hmm? Now, what happens with skepticism is, skepticism can only tell you what is wrong. It can never tell you what is right. So it's it's not very uh, trying to uh, trying to learn or trying to uh, uh, if we grow with only a skeptical or a, even more a cynical attitude, then we will never be able to do anything in our lives. So the attitude. So now what the Bhagavad Gita tells us is Maya Adhyakshena Prakriti Suyate Sachara Acharam He Tunhane Na Kanteya Jagat Vipari Vartate. Maya Adhyakshina Prakriti That everything is happening under my control, Krishna is saying. And I have a plan for everything. So when Shila Prabhupada came to America, when he was just on the Boston Pier, looking at the coastline, uh, looking at the uh, big expanse of American prosperity, at that time, he composed a song. And that song he says, Aache ki chukarja tape ei anumane, nahe ke no ani bena ei ugrasthane. He says, My dear Lord, you must have some plan for me. Aache ki chukarja tape ei anumane. I infer this, I guess this. Then Prabhupada didn't know what the plan was. He's a lone person who has come to a foreign land. He doesn't even know whether his accent will be understood by people around him. He doesn't even know whether anybody will be interested in this message. But he has come. 
He's saying, Krishna, you must have planned for me. Otherwise, why did you bring me here? So this was the attitude. You must have some, Krishna must have some plan. So we may not know what that plan is. But the attitude that every, whatever is happening is for some purpose. Ultimately, we have to live with some attitude. So either we can be theistic or we can be atheistic. Theism, the bhakti worldview tells us that whatever problems we face, they have a purpose. They are meant to help us grow. Grow in wisdom, ultimately grow in devotion. They are meant for our spiritual evolution. To bring us closer to ourselves, to our soul. And to bring us closer to God, who is the soul of our soul. That is what everything is meant for in life. Atheism, what it does is, it does not remove the problems in our life. It just the, removes the hope that problems have some purpose. There are problems and that's all that is. What do you do with it? Just live like that. There was a famous atheistic philosopher, Alberto Camus. He said that life is misery. Therefore, the only philosophical question worth asking is, whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not an not in, uh, uh, exception. Other philosophers who said that, oh, the most fortunate thing is to never be born. The next best thing is to die early if you have been born. And the most unfortunate thing is to have a long life. This is such a distorted way of looking at life. Because for them, life has no ultimate hope. This problem, this problem, this problem. What is the point of it all? So bhakti helps us, not just in a, again, in a sentimental sense. Oh, there is some plan. But bhakti helps us to get the philosophical understanding. How there is a plan, there is a purpose. And with that attitude, when we look at the world around us, then what happens? We look at it with greater focus. We look at it with greater purpose. Generally, whenever we have any problem, whenever we have a lot, even if we have a lot of problems or little problems, if we have a sense of purpose, okay, what am I meant to do over here? What am I doing over here? That sense of purpose gives us some power. Okay, let me do this. Say, if we are sick in a hospital and are in pain, I mean, there are two cases. Say, there are two patients who are in a hospital in next, 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 adjacent beds. Both of them are sick and both of them are in pain. But one of them, the disease has not been diagnosed and there is no treatment being given. For the other, the disease has been diagnosed and the treatment is being given. So now, at present, both of them are in pain. But their future is very different. So the difference between a theist and an atheist is like that. The world is a tough place for everyone. Everybody will have problems. But a theist has the attitude, okay, whatever is the problem, this is a this is a this is a curable disease. Let me take the cure. But if a patient has the attitude, oh, this disease has no meaning, there is no cure for it, it's just going to increase their misery more and more. So, the, the, what the Bhagavad Gita tells us is, ultimately, it is, we are disconnected from God. And that is the root cause of our suffering. So, the more we become connected with God, the closer we go to Him, the lesser the difficulties in our life will be. Not that the difficulties will go away, but they will become more manageable. That's the attitude part. So, Shri Prabhupada had that attitude. Krishna, you must have some plan. So that is the acronym. What is the acronym? Tab. Tab. So we have discussed. T was. And A is. Now last remaining is. Behavior. Behavior means how do I act in the situation? See, it's remarkable that no matter how bad a situation is, how we behave in that situation is up to us. Now, one of my friends is a doctor, he, and he is not only a doctor, he is uh, he's working in a hospice and palliative care. So he says, told me that when we are treating patients who are near death, 
there may be two people who might have the same cancer and both of them might be in a similar amount of pain but the two people can sometimes respond entirely differently so our actions are not entirely determined by our situations some people when they are sick they they become so resentful they complain they yell at everyone and then what happens they are sick but they make others sick <laughs> of them <laughs> not they make others sick not they they can spread the disease also by infection but they make others sick of them so it just becomes such a pain to deal with them but there some people okay thank you at least i am getting this treatment thank you for helping me take this treatment so how they behave say for example a sick person how they talk with someone they can snap and yell and complain or they can be polite that is always up to us so our behave our behavior our actions are not the pro is not the product of our situations alone and what what do so what can we do i mean prabhupad was in america he didn't know he, he himself right that uh, when i came out of the ship i didn't know whether i should turn left or right so what did he do in the same prayer mark in a bhagavad dharma from which i have been quoting means when he is entering into america now oh, he has a purpose i want to share bhakti wisdom with the western world so he he says he concludes that prayer by saying na chao na chao prabhu na chao se mate kashthera putta ni jata na chao se mate my dear lord please make me down. make me dance if you have brought me here to dance then make me dance just as a puppeteer makes a puppet dance make me dance now what he means by this is my dear lord if you have a plan for me please guide me what is your plan please make me act according to your plan shri prabhupada has asked what is the best prayer that we can offer to the lord and robert said pray to him pray to him, oh lord please give me the strength to serve you always please give me the strength to serve you so whatever happens in our life we at our core are souls we are parts of krishna and we are meant to serve him so whether it is in our family responsibilities or it is in our professional ob uh, professional obligations whether it is in our taking care of our health it's all ultimately meant to be in a mood of service to krishna so if we have that attitude krishna i want to serve you this is where who we think of ourselves i started earlier by talking about power so if we think that i am meant to be a controller then situations can come up that can completely frustrate us because we might be put in places where we just can't control anything but if we think i am a servant i am meant to serve so how can i serve in the situation now as a service we can even make our plans in a mood of service to krishna but if our plan doesn't work okay krishna how do you want me to serve you now so we are attached to krishna not to our plans what happens sometimes if we are very attached to our plans so if we think i am the controller you know, i am the manager of this project i am the i am the lord of this house i am the boss of this office whatever and we think based on that things have to happen the way i plan them so our plan say if this is i am here the plan is here so if we, see in bhakti we are meant to hold our plans lightly not tightly so what do i have when i hold my plan very tightly what happens it's like the plan comes here 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 it's right here around my eyes <laughs> now apart from my plan i can't see anything at all <laughs> and if my plan is not working then i just become completely blinded all that i can see is why is my plan not working why is this not happening why is this not happening why is this not happening 
our plan, say, I am here, my plan is here and the reality is here. The plan is meant to help me shape the reality. But if, say, the plan is here and the, the plan has come here and the reality is here, I can't keep looking at the plan. I have to look at the reality and deal with the reality. And that is psychological flexibility. Psychological rigidity means that we can't think except according to our plan. Psychological flexibility means, okay, my plan is here, now it's not working, let me think about something else. So, suppose somebody is learning rowing and they have made a plan, I'll practice rowing and then I'll call my friends and when all of them are there, I will row smoothly and then everybody will click photos and they'll put them on Facebook and everybody will appreciate what a wonderful rower I am. <coughs> and then they have this whole movie planned out in their mind of how things are meant to work. And then they get into the boat, they start rowing. And suddenly, a monster wave comes and knocks their boat. And the next moment, there is no boat under them. There are no boats with no oars with them. Now, if they still keep rowing, <laughs> they will drown. So now, now if they try to row, that's useless. But that doesn't mean they can't do anything. They can paddle, they can swim, they can get to the coast right now. So, if we, if we are so attached to rowing that we can't even accept the reality what it is, then that psychological rigidity will drown us. So, if we think I am the controller and everything has to happen according to my way, then we will be disempowered. But if we understand I am a servant, I am meant to serve Krishna. My plan was also service to Krishna. If the plan is not working, okay. How can I serve now? Then we'll find that there is always some way to serve. There's always something that we can do in every situation. Even if it's a small thing. I'll conclude with one example and then we can have some questions. One of my friends was a bodybuilder. And he was a boxer and he had a very powerful body and he once got an injury by going to he got fractured and then his hand was in a cast he couldn't move at all and then his physiotherapist came to him and told him okay now you have to start exercising he said what exercise i can't even get out of bed i can't even lift my hand he said okay can you can you lift your little finger he said okay yes okay he said Lift your little finger 10 times in the morning, 10 times in the afternoon, 10 times in the evening. So that is your exercise. Exercise! <laughs> he thought exercise meant you know lifting big weights. Yeah, that is not exercise. He says, no, this is your exercise now. Do it. That's not exercise. He said, do it, Lord. Do it. The therapist told him, he said, okay, and he started doing it. He just did it for one day, two days. And then the doctor told him, can you lift up your other finger? He said, yes. Then the arm, then the, then the hand, then the forearm, then the full hand. And within two, three, within three weeks, he got back full mobility. But he had to begin with just a little finger. So similarly, for us, when we face big problems, at that time, we feel, I am powerless. But behavior means, okay, in this situation, what can I do? What can I do? The mind will say, you can do nothing, everything is ruined. No, what can I do? No, you can't do anything. When the mind starts going on that one track, oh, you are powerless, you can't do anything. You can turn around and ask the mind, mind the question. Okay, you're saying things are so bad. Can I make them worse? Hey, what nonsense, you know? Who wants to make them worse? Isn't it? They're already bad. No, we don't want to make them worse, but can I make them worse? Yeah, no matter how bad situations are, I can always make them worse. Isn't it? We always have that power. We might... We might be completely bankrupt 
maybe living in a small uh, small room and you know we can create an explosive and blow up that room also you know no matter how bad things are we can make them worse and if we can make them worse that means we are not as powerless as we think we can make them better also so okay what can i do right now so behavior means what can i do right right now what can what is the right thing that i can do right now how can i fix the situation or at least take a step toward fixing the situation so prabhupad he did not know what is going to do he just went wherever he got the opportunity he had a place where he was staying he went there and when he was in butler pennsylvania at that time the people over there his hosts they never thought he was going to come so it was it was like a embarrassment for them and then they got some of the guests to come and for them he was like a curiosity object or oh, some swami from somewhere has come but prabhupad used that curiosity to get an article published in a local newspaper the swami from india has come to teach bhakti and from that in a nearby university there was a professor who was teaching hinduism and he said i have got a real hindu monk well get them to come and speak to you and so that small 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 step started happening then prabhupad came to new york he came to the lower east side now when he came there prabhupad started giving talks over there for the initial talks there is nobody coming practically so then prabhu no prabhupad at that time didn't even have money to do any publicity normally if you have a program you try to do some make some posters distribute some po- uh, there's no internet at that time so no social media but Prabhupada could so Prabhupada uses the oh, use the oldest strategy, oldest publication strategy, publicizing strategy. What was that? He just went out for long walks, and because he was in Saffron, you know, he was quite an unusual sight. And one day he was going for a walk, and he went out for days and days for long walks, just observing. Nothing happened. But one day he was going for a walk. and as he was walking on the other side he saw some young man with a long big beard walking along and he looked at him he is looking at swami ji and this young man was a english professor english howard wheeler and he he was planning to go to a friend and take some drugs so that he saw the swami ji hey what is this now he had he was already a spiritual seeker he had gone to india in search for god for for guru but he hadn't found any guru so he had come back So he looked around. He saw this Swami. Hey, what is this Swami doing here? Have I already taken drugs? Am I in a high? And then a big truck passed by. He thought, Will the Swami still be there after the truck goes? <laughs> the truck went by, and he saw Swami was still there. And then he brushed his eyes and he looked once again. Another truck went by, and he saw another Swami had stopped, and the Swami was looking at him. And then he crossed over and ran over, and he said, Swami, are, are you from India? Yes, and you? No, oh, I'm from America, but I, I've been to India. And that person had a whole group of friends who were serious spiritual seekers, and they became Prabhupada's first followers. And from there, these things expanded, and they expanded in such a way that when Shri Prabhupada came to America, alone, penniless. in 1965 by 1977 he had traversed navigated the globe 14 times on teaching tours he had initiated over thousands and thousands of disciples he had inspired millions of people to raise their consciousness and live a more meaningful life he had written over 70 books in fact there's a scholar of religion sils and juda he said that now um, if somebody wrote a fiction book talking about a swami he went to a distant land and started a spiritual organization it says no publisher would publish such a book because this is such an unrealistic plot it says nowhere in the history of the world it has happened that some one person came to a distant land and his audience were culturally linguistically philosophically educationally religiously completely different from him and he did inspire them and inspired not just one out of but thousands thousands of people so when prabhupada just kept doing his part 
Krishna had, Krishna was also doing his part. And Prabhupada just kept, whoever he met, he talked with them. And then Krishna sent the right people. And then things just took off. So our behavior is in our control. And sometimes our actions, our right actions may seem to have no effect. No, I am doing the right thing but there is no result from it. But sometimes we might just do one right thing and that can have a chain effect. And that chain effect, sometimes when you produce sound, there is resonance. We produce a little sound but then there is resonance that just goes up. So like that, when we keep doing our part, our part might seem tiny and this problem is so big, what can I do? But if we just keep doing our part, behavior right, let me do this. One small thing, one small thing, one small thing. Now Krishna is also doing his part. And when Krishna does his part, according to his time, things can change dramatically in one moment. So we focus on doing our part diligently. And by that we can bring about a change. Every one of us is significant because we are all parts of God. And God cares for us because He is God. His love for us is not based on who we are. Now we may be virtuous, we may be sinful, we may be somewhere in between. No, all of us are fallen. And if we don't think we are fallen, then we are really fallen. <laughs> <laughs> but however we may be, Krishna still loves us. Because He is the all-loving Father, Lord of everyone. His love for us is not based on who we are. It's based on who He is. And He is present in our hearts. He's observing us. He cares for us. He is not there in our heart to catch us when we do wrong. Hey, you did this, now get this punishment. That's not His mood. He's there in our heart to catch us when we fall. Just like a mother. Helping a baby. The mother is watching the baby walking. If the baby falls, the mother is not going to clap the hand. Oh, you fell down. <laughs> the mother is going to run and catch the baby. So the Lord is there inside us to help us. So if we understand that, you know, he is, we do our part and he will do his part. So by that, whatever situation we are in, we can have the positive purpose. We can have the positive power by which we can move on. Now, the dramatic things that Prabhupada was able to do, we may not be able to do that. But in our own way, we can create light. Now, if we open a new tab in our own lives, at the very least, we will light our own heart. There can be the darkness of negativity in our own hearts. At least that darkness will go away. We will light our own heart. And if we light our hearts, we can we may encourage or inspire others to light their own hearts also. Now we may not be able to light the whole world, but we each one of us can light our corner of the world. And suppose suddenly power goes off, everything is dark. Now we turn on one candle or we turn on our flashlight. And seeing us, somebody else turns on their flashlight. And somebody else turns on their flashlight. And then Beautifully, even in the darkness, illumination will come and we will find a way ahead. So in this way, opening a new tab in our lives is the way by which we can tap our inner power and by the grace of Krishna, create a better life for ourselves and create a better world around ourselves. I'll summarize. I spoke today on the theme of tapping our inner power. Everything that we do right from a baby learning to cry loudly is actually a search for power. Not necessarily in the bad sense, the purpose behind the power can be good or bad, but we are all looking for power. Scientific advancement is also a search for power. Technology has given us a lot of power. But unfortunately in this pursuit for outer power, we have lost our inner power, our thoughts are going wild and for many people their minds are hurting them and even killing them.
so even with outer power if we don't have inner power we'll hurt ourselves and others and sometimes if outer power is taken away from us and if we haven't developed inner power then we will feel completely powerless and broken down so we all can and should tap our inner power and for tap tapping that inner power i talked about an acronym what is that tap thoughts attitudes and behavior thoughts we give the example of shri prabhupad he was alone penniless contactless and even his body broke down utterly powerless but he was getting strength by thinking about the lord so our thoughts can energize us or de-energize us if we think negative we just feel powerless if we think positive will become enlivened and the thinking positive is not denying problems it is just recognizing that thinking about problems constantly can itself be a problem i talked about the graph how a problem solving capacity increases as we think about a problem up to a particular point but beyond that flattens and then goes down so if we can learn to direct our thoughts towards something constructive instead of obsessing over the problems then we can get this power and the most constructive object is god krishna bhakti yoga is not just to do some ritual it is to make our mind spiritual that means to make our mind habituated to thinking about krishna thinking about krishna amidst all the turbulence of the world is like coming in an air conditioned room amidst the heat we get relief and with that relief then we can get rejuvenated and face the problem so it is not running away from problem but it is getting strength to face the problem then a was attitude when the problems are coming we can either have the attitude oh life is life is life stinks and the world is a terrible place and my life is doomed and that will completely dishearten us or we can have the attitude that uh, yeah bad things happen but everything that happens can be for good there is a purpose a plan and this is not just sentimental idea we look at our own very existence it depends on things that are beyond our power we could don't digest our own food uh, we don't produce the milk in our mothers that's not the mother produce it so there are there is a higher something higher which is supporting our existence so we do our part and that being will do their part so prabhupada when he was he didn't know what to do he said krishna you must have some plan and he prabhupada focused on doing his part doing his part brought us to behavior behavior means that whatever happens how we act in that situation is up to us if we think we are controllers and if we are attached to our plans and the plans will blind us we won't be able to do anything but if we have psychological flexibility not rigidity okay my plan was here but my i'm not attached to my plan if this plan doesn't work okay how can i function now? how can i work right now so then we'll be able to deal with reality as it is and if you just you you know somebody's hand is fractured you can just lift a little finger so like that what is one thing right i can do in this situation krishna how can i serve you in this situation we do one we do one right thing and then one more right thing and one more right thing and by that we all can make a difference shri prabhupada just kept trying to meet talk about krishna with people and krishna brought him in contact with serious people then who helped him spread the message all over the world so our right actions we seem to have no result but if we keep doing them at one particular time by god's grace there will be a chain reaction and we set off a chain by which by higher plan the right thing that we are doing they will have a multiplier effect so if we just keep doing our part we tap our inner power by opening a tap within us then even if there is darkness all around us we can create light inside us and we can create light around us so by tapping our inner power we can create a better life for ourselves and we can contribute to creating a better world around us thank you very much hare krishna hey. so we are kind of running a little bit late on time but you know we can open at least 
Some questions, anyone have any questions? Yeah, that's so, what I'm saying. So one or two questions we can take, if, it, if it's okay. Yes. Yes. Talk a little bit louder, Martin, because... So Prabhu, when uh, we face bigger problems in our life, so suddenly the mind stops working, mm -hmm. and uh, then you start questioning to the Lord that why it happened and everything till the the situation cools down a bit and then you come to the con uh, concerns that um, okay whatever bad happens maybe for good and give me strength to face the problem but uh, when we suddenly hear uh, some problem comes to us or our loved ones then um, we start questioning That's so true. is that is that uh, not a good uh, attitude okay yeah. and if we feel if we consider lord to be our father then it's is it wrong to okay. ask him for something okay yeah so if something bad happens initially we may start questioning the lord so is that a bad thing and can we ask him if we consider him to be our father can we ask him for some things okay see first of all every relationship for it to be true and meaningful, it will have a whole gamut of emotions. And then the relationship is not rich. So, uh, when bad things happen, it's understandable that we may sometimes question the Lord. That happened to Draupadi. When Draupadi was attempted to be disrobed, she called out to the Lord, and the, sometimes in movies, in Mahabharata movie, I'd see the Krishna coming over, but nobody saw Krishna. All that happened was, her garment became inexhaustible. And later on, when she was in the forest, Krishna came to meet her over there. And she broke down and she protested. He said, Krishna, I called you. Why did you come? He said, I am your devotee. I am your relative. I am your friend. I needed your help. Why did you come? And Krishna didn't say, I am God. How dare you question my plan? <laughs> Krishna didn't say that. Krishna gave a very almost human-like explanation. Krishna says, you know, I didn't know this gambling match was going on. He said, there was a demon, Shalva, who had attacked Dwarka, and I was busy defending Dwarka from him. As soon as I got the news, I immediately came here to help him. So, you now God is big enough to accommodate even our doubts, even our questions, even our anger. God is big enough to accommodate whatever emotions you may have. And it's just natural, it's human, if something terrible happens, you know, to feel frustrated, to feel disheartened, to feel doubtful, that's just human. Being spiritual is not denying our humanity, humanity, or suppressing our humanity. It is actually expanding our humanity. That means, yes, I feel like that, but what do I do now? We feel like that, so sometimes those feelings will come, but gradually they'll diminish. So, you know, one of my friends is a firefighter. He's telling me that whenever a firefighter sees a big fire, at that time, even the most experienced firefighter may panic for a moment. What a horrible big fire this is. But the difference between an experienced firefighter and a no, no, and a new firefighter. A novice firefighter, when they see the big fire, they panic so much that they drop their hose and they freeze. Whereas the experienced firefighter, they may also panic, but because of their training, their trained instincts come into the picture and they say, okay, this fire is very big, but let's attack it from here. So, as for a few moments, the unwanted emotional reaction may come. But training means those movements don't last for long. Those movements get, get diminished and the right reaction comes up quickly. So similarly, as we keep practicing bhakti, we train ourselves to connect with Krishna. Then even if the unhealthy or unwanted emotions come up, they won't last for long. So if we think they should not come up at all, that's unrealistic. It's understandable. Sometimes some bad things happen, some doubts may come up within us. But we don't have to let them dwell. We don't have to let them grow. So as far as asking the Lord for something is concerned, 
certainly we can ask the important thing is that we don't make our devotion devotion conditional to the fulfillment of that request so we can say my dear lord my life is devoted to you i want i want to serve you and for for my service to you uh, this is something which i need please let this work out and this is also my service to you but when we offer this prayer it is perfectly fine we don't have to worry too much is material or spiritual the important thing is for a devotee if we're doing it in the mood of service it's a part of spiritual things the important thing is we connect with the lord and we can also have an element of surrender that is lord if if this is not going to be done then please guide me how i should move forward i want to serve you and this is the way i feel i can best serve you but this is not working then how can i serve you so to have desires is is this natural even within bhakti i i desire it should be like this but to have demands is not good so we can certainly pray to the lord just like we might ask our, our parent for help but we don't make it a demand and we don't make our devotion conditional to the fulfillment conditional to the fulfillment of the prayer my dear lord i am your servant and this will help me to serve you so please arrange for this and if not then please give me the intelligence how i can serve you now answer your question thank you yes so uh, if there are more questions may I request uh, to hold your questions and probably will be here because we are a little bit late and we have a few critical announcement to be made tonight so can we hold or is it okay and then you can talk to probably right okay i hope probably more people benefit by the answering it's not the just person but maybe you know he comes very rarely okay. maybe we can hold another few minutes okay, okay that's fine <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you so you're not attached to your clan <laughs> <laughs> If you notice once we have to sorry this is true um not glorifying my question you know i thought many people can answer and you know i mean your answer mm. can be very great others i started reading this book the rowest one gita diary um mm. um in in that book you write that you know we can live in present something kind of better thing like most of when we are living in future that you know something happens then i will yeah. be happy and when i get retired then i will be happy and you know kind of but then we can be happy at current moment we should live there i think the title yeah. is i mean present is the only thing we we have yeah okay something so coming to your tab uh, you know attitude that you know this miserable yeah. thing is going to pass soon and i'm going to get better hmm. so how do you reconcile these okay. both things together okay so it is also it's often said that live in the present but then if you have the attitude that things will become better in future how do we reconcile the two see live we we should live in the present but we shouldn't live for the present live in the present means focus on what i can do in the present right now don't worry about this problem in the future don't worry, don't lament about that problem in the past focus on what you can do in the future, present so the behavior part is what will connect with the present what can i do right now the things are very bad but right now what is one right thing that i can do so that is about the present but we have to live in the present but we can't live for the present in fact intelligence means to see that the present is going to lead to the future and then i shouldn't just live in a way that by cause of the way i am living the present my future will be dark so a child might just want to play but the parents tell the child to study so the child may just live for the present i am enjoying this why should i study but the parents see the future so when we talk about live in the present the point over there is focus on what you can do right now but don't live for the present that means what can i do right now in a way that means by which i can play my part in creating a better future so we by our very nature uh strive 
to make things better. So that's that's just the human initiative. So uh, that idea that you know we can make things better in the future, at least at some level in some ways, that's what drives all human actions, and uh, that's why we act. So I would say that both are fine because both are perfectly reconcilable because. What vision of the future do I have? And what am I doing in the present? Going back to the sick person's example, the if a person is very sick and they're in pain, and you tell them, live in the present. Well, my present is all in pain right now. Literally, don't think about the future. Well, only the future that my health will be better, that's what will help them to live, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? So, but just don't think I'll be healthy in the future. Take the medicine now. Yeah, if you have to do some exercise, even if it is painful, do some exercise now. So live in the present means take the medication, do the exercise. But don't live for the present means don't think that this is the situation you have to always face. Things will become better. Did that answer your question? Thank you. So you had a question here somewhere? Okay. So thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada Ki. गौर भक्त वृंद की आई गौर प्रेमानंद सो दिस इज माय फर्स्ट विजिट हियर एंड इट वाज वंडरफुल टू सी द वाइब्रेंट बॉडी इज वेल इट इज वंडरफुल टू सी द वाइब्रेंट डिवोटी कम्युनिटी हियर मेनी मेनी सिंसियर सीरियस डिवोटीज ईगर टू हियर अबाउट कृष्णा एंड लर्न एंड अप्लाई द प्रिंसिपल्स So my best wishes and prayers to all of you in your individual journeys towards Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So uh, I'm really very happy to see all of you. <laughs>